a Turkish official says a second round of evacuations from eastern Aleppo has been completed. More than 2,000 people are now believed to have left the eastern area of the city. Many of them have already reached rebel held territory in Idlib, where they've spoken about their ordeal. We just got here from Aleppo. We did not want to leave. We were forced to leave. We did not leave because of the shelling. No, we put up with the shelling for six years. We left because we feared for our honor and being violated by the regime. And we prayed to God that they would not capture us and violate our honor. Well, the buses and ambulances left the old city and headed west. From there, they made their way towards rebel-held city of Idlib, around 30 kilometers from the border with Turkey. Well, the U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry has addressed the desperate situation in Aleppo. He laid the blame squarely at the feet of Syria's Bashar al-Assad and said if the regime and its allies did not return to the negotiating table, the bloodshed would only continue. We have arrived now at another critical point, another critical juncture. If Aleppo falls completely and people are slaughtered in that small area, it will be even harder to be able to bring people around. And it will not end the war. The fall of Aleppo, should it happen, does not end the war. It will continue. There still is the challenge of governing and the challenge of reuniting the country and the challenge of rebuilding the country. And how many countries will step up and rebuild it for the policies that are being executed today? So provided we are able to stabilize the situation in Aleppo, it is essential that we move forward at the earliest possible moment with a Syrian-led political process aimed at ending the war and transitioning to a new and more representative government. And without that meaningful transition of power in which the voices of the Syrian people are heard, <coughs> the opposition will continue to fight. <coughs> Terrorists will continue to be drawn to the country and millions of Syrians will continue to be forced to flee their homes. So here I want to emphasize that every single party I've spoken to in recent days, in Paris last week and from here in Washington this week, as recently as this morning, every stakeholder tells me <clears throat> they are ready and willing to get back on the path to Geneva, and that includes the legitimate Syrian opposition, it includes Turkey and Qatar and the Arab states. The only remaining question is whether the Syrian regime, with Russia's support, is willing to go to Geneva, prepared to negotiate constructively, and whether or not they're willing to stop this slaughter of their own people. Well, our Jennifer Glass has been listening to Secretary of State's comments and joins us now live from Washington with more. So, Jennifer, what did you make of uh, some of the tone of Mr. Kerry? He seemed quite resigned to the fact that uh, the U.S. had seemingly been outmaneuvered in uh, trying to deal with the ceasefire in Aleppo. Well, Kamali, there was no question that Secretary Kerry blames the Syrian regime and the Russian military for what's going on in Aleppo. He says these two groups, the Syrian regime, Bashar al-Assad's regime, and the Russian military that is backing him, must make a strategic move for peace, a strategic decision for peace. The United States wants, wants to pursue a diplomatic move, but I think the real key, what he said there, was a Syrian-led process to transition to new leadership, and that is going to be the sticking point. Bashar al-Assad has said over and over again he has no intention of stepping down, and now that they are making progress in Aleppo militarily, there seems to be no reason why he would want to go to the negotiating table at all. And so the United States has said, all this week that it will continue its policy. If Aleppo falls, the war will not end. It will continue to arm the opposition and help the opposition. Uh, we heard just in the last week that the United States will send 200 more U.S. ground forces, bringing the number of U.S. forces on the ground to 500. And just last week, President Barack Obama uh, also lifted restrictions against arming uh, the, uh, the opposition in Syria. And now they say that is for the fight against ISIS, but also this will be the fight in, uh, in uh, Syria as well uh, against the uh, Assad regime backed by uh, Russia and airstrikes. So uh, really, Secretary of State Kerry pulling no punches here, laying the blame clearly uh, in the camp of Bashar al-Assad and the Russians, and saying that they must uh, come to the negotiations.
negotiating table uh, to bring out a peace, to, to make a durable and lasting peace here, but there just seems no indication uh, that they have any motivation to do so. Absolutely not. And, uh, Mr. Kerry saying all the right things, as he always does, but uh, of course words uh, need to have an effect and they're not having an effect at the moment. And of course the interesting thing is that he'll be out of a job uh, next month uh, when the new team comes in and we're not sure exactly how they're going to handle the situation. That's right. You can't look at any of this without looking at the political backdrop here in Washington. The Obama administration is in its final six weeks. President-elect Trump, his relationship with Russia is very much at question here. His new secretary of state, Rex Tillerson, is said to have a strong relationship with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, and maybe that's what the Russians are playing for, waiting for time, waiting for the Obama administration to finish its work and to see what President-elect Trump will do when he takes office next month. Uh, you can't, I don't think you can look at any of this without really understanding that kind of prism, uh, the difficult relationship right now. Of course, we've had reports uh, that Russia, that Russia was, uh, the, in intelligence aid, the intelligence community here has been reporting that uh, Russian officials were involved in the hacking uh, that may have influenced the U.S. election here. So that's very much a backdrop of what the United States' relationship with Russia is. It certainly seems much more frosty than it has been uh, in recent days, and Secretary of State Kerry making no bones about it, that he blames Russia and the Assad regime for what's going on in Aleppo, and that, that the Assad regime and, and the Russians must make a decision uh, to, to bring peace about. But as I said, there really is no indication that they would have any motivation to do so because they're making military advances on the ground. Absolutely. Okay, Jennifer, for now in Washington, thank you. Well, Russia says that the operation to clear eastern Aleppo should take two or three days. Now, this report by TRT World's Abu Bakr al-Shamahi contains some exclusive footage of civilians as they began to leave the besieged city. On their way to safety, people who've lived through the battle for Aleppo and survived are leaving their homes behind. Traveling on buses provided by the Syrian regime, many are tired. Some are wounded, but all are defiant. They have done so much to us. They have slaughtered us with warplanes. They destroyed our houses. We escaped with our clothes only. For two months, we are suffering from one place to another. We were under siege for six months, and we were evacuated by force, and we would be back by force. The injured and sick were given priority and helped onto ambulances. We hope things will move smoothly. In fact, we had no other option but to save the lives of around 75,000 people in a two-square-kilometre area who are exposed to all types of bombs. We are sorry that this has to happen. In the late afternoon, dozens more buses and ambulances left East Aleppo in a slow-moving convoy. But it's a nervous move to safety. Earlier in the day, another convoy of ambulances carrying wounded evacuees is reported to have come under fire from Iranian-backed forces. The first group of injured and heavily wounded people has moved, but there is huge obstructions from Hezbollah and Iranian militias. So far, none of the injured have been killed by gunfire, but another person was shot. They are firing on the convoy. The evacuation is part of an operation negotiated by Turkey and Russia. Most people here will go to Idlib. It's still in rebel hands, but nobody knows for how long. It's a humanitarian crisis and the UN appears largely powerless. 50,000 have been displaced from East Aleppo is, is an estimate that we now have. Uh, most of these have been assisted by UN uh, relief. Uh, we are not able to provide humanitarian protection by presence to all of these people simply because we're not allowed to move freely in the area. We can access the camps where the internally displaced now assemble, uh, where conditions are very difficult. As people were evacuated, Syrian television broadcast pictures of the Syrian flag being raised in eastern Aleppo. After more than four years, celebrations for the regime. But the cost in human suffering has been huge. And for those leaving today, the hope will be that even a refugee camp will be better than living under the bombardment of regime and Russian airstrikes. 
Abu Bakr al-Shamahi, Siyati World, Gaziantep. <laughs>